Hi guys, thanks for being here. We're here to talk about how the connected home is shaping the way that uh, we interact with the spaces we inhabit. Joining me is Linus Lundberg of Nest Labs. He's the head of Enterprise Partnerships. Uh, to his right is Alex Reed, Vice President of Haiku Home, which is a division of Big Ass Solutions, uh, followed by Cindy Christie, President and COO of Asturian. And then we have uh, Roger Dewey, CEO of Able Device. And finally, but not uh, least, Kevin Peterson, president of AT&T's Digital Life. So we're going to start off with some very brief remarks from our panelists and then go to uh, questions. Linus, why don't you start? OK, so I, I just wanted to give you a brief introduction of what we do and, and why we do it. Um, first, a little bit of a, a manifesto that kind of describes how we think about um, you know, why we, why, we're, uh, why we started the company. So uh, our home is a special place. It's where we feel safe, where we can be ourselves. Uh, essentially, we, we love our homes. Um, but some of the things in our homes um, prevents us, prevents the home from being everything it can be. Things that beep, things that die on us, keep us in the dark, uh, things that we basically learn to ignore over time. And most of these things actually look and function the same they did 50 years ago. So at Nest, we asked ourselves, why should we uh, have to predict the future to stay comfortable in our homes? Uh, well, now we don't have to. The Nest Learning Thermostat will actually um, learn your schedule, understand your prefer preferred temperatures and, and your thermal, uh, you know, how your home is working from a thermal perspective. So that was our first product, really trying to solve that problem. And um, we then asked ourselves, why do we have to wait for the neighbors to call? Uh, so we developed Nest Protect, a smoke and CO detector, to help you uh, stay on top of what's happening in your home uh, if there is a um, smoke, smoke alarm or, or CO alarm. Um, I guess the slides are not cooperating here. Let's see. And uh, why can't we see what's happening at home uh, when we're not there? Um, and that's why we introduced the Nest camera, uh, an indoor camera to keep an eye on making sure your middle schooler came home after, after school or whether your dog is gnawing at the couch again. Uh, and we also have an outdoor camera to keep an eye on your front yard and, and backyard. Um, so hopefully that gives you a sense of how we think about kind of reinventing the home, um, making products that simplify people's lives and keep them safe and comfortable in their homes. Alex? So, make sure, can everybody hear me okay? My name is Alex Reed. I'm with Haiku Home, which is a division of Big Ass Solutions. Many of you may know our most known brand, Big Ass Fans. We make large overhead ceiling fans. It's OK to snicker. We have the word ass in our name. Um, it's very memorable and also probably not the company you would expect to be uh, representing at a wireless conference. Uh, but our path to the connected home has been a very unconventional one. Um, but we've always been following customer needs. So we were founded in 1999 as the HVLS fan company, high volume, low speed. Uh, very catchy, right? I mean, a, a nice, easy roll off the tongue acronym. Um, but after a couple of years of customers asking if we were the guys that made those big ass fans, uh, we ultimately changed the name. Um, we got our start in the agricultural and industrial sector, making large overhead fans, um, but those fans were soon applied in conditioned spaces like schools and churches and restaurants um, to save energy on air conditioning, to keep occupants more comfortable, um, and ultimately those same overhead fans that you know were 10 feet in diameter, weighed a couple hundred pounds, were being installed in living rooms. Um, so we recognized throughout the course of our history that people were applying our technology in unexpected ways. So parallel to that, we were developing solutions that were quieter, that were more lightweight, more aesthetically appealing, and ultimately connected, because we knew that we needed to address these different customers in different ways. So we're very much a product manufacturer that starts with the customer need and then focuses on building really good products. When it makes sense to connect them, we do so. If it doesn't make sense and it doesn't add value to the customer experience, uh, we will decline to do so. Um, but in the residential space, we're best known for our Haiku ceiling fan. It's won about 65 international design awards. We always start with aesthetics, industrial design, um, premium materials, and then we focus on the operation of the product. So in this case, we were able to add a series of sensors, 
uh, to monitor the environment, uh, and to adjust the operation of the, the product autonomously, uh, because you really don't want to spend a lot of time thinking about your ceiling fans or your overhead lights. You really want your space to be comfortable. You want it lit at certain times of the day or when you're occupied. So I think the connected home can be a lot simpler, um, but it starts with really asking those questions about what your customers need and then focusing on developing really good products, and that's what our company does. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Cindy Christie, and I'm the president and COO of Assurian. Assurian is the global leader in enabling uh, life, connected life products and services, and we do that through protection. We do that through our um, technology as well as through our support services. Um, today, we, we support our carrier partners as well as our retail partners and our pay TV partners for over 290 million uh, customers on a global basis. And we make sure that we make their life easier by enabling whatever they need in their connected life, whether it's an issue or whether they need advice or frankly, they just need to get more out of their technology. So when you think about Assurian, uh, our vision is that we want to deliver on life's operating system. When life and technology meet, that's where we actually deliver our value prop. So our, our angle is a little different in terms of the connection here, because I'm going to focus a little bit uh, kind of where he left off in terms of the consumer. If you take a look at what's going on when life and technology meets, we're going to talk a lot today about the macro view of what's op what the opportunity is and what that means relative to the connected home and how to deliver the services. But at some level, we have to take that vision and that opportunity down to the micro level in terms of the individual user. In somebody's home, when dad comes home with the corporate liable phone from one carrier, the family's on another carrier, they get cable from a third operator, they've got Nest in one room, somebody's got two iPads and a Mac, as well as mom's got uh, the Dell and she's on a different system, and you want to enable all these services and solutions, we've got a lot of technology with a lot of robustness and power, but we don't have a lot of connectivity and compatibility that goes on across there. What do you do when that happens? And what I would tell you is, we focus on the consumer pain points. What are those use cases and those things that are, they're gonna run into from a service and support perspective, and how can we help to enable and to deliver on the value of the connected home for that unique user, for that unique family that drives personal utility and greater value of their services. And that's how we uh, spend our time. I am Roger Dewey, Able Device. Uh, Able Device, we've developed technology that resides on SIM cards, on the operator SIMs. And at its, at its most basic, um, our, our product offering, SIMBay, uh, allows the SIM to act as a processor. So you can actually put applications on the SIM and have the SIM work as the processor, whether it's turning on lights or reading meters or whatever uh, application you might have. Um, so it, it, it works very well in, in um, applications that don't require a whole lot of processing and throughput, uh, and it's very secure since it resides on the SIM. It's basically unhackable since you use the network authentication to be able to update or get access to the, um, to the processor, in this case, the SIM. Uh, at its lowest level, since we can actually use the SIM as a processor, and every operator gives you a SIM, and it's out there in the machines, these machines are developed uh, pretty much autonomously. So companies develop these machines, and as far as the operator is concerned, all they're doing now is providing a subscription, and, and they're giving that to you through the SIM. After that, there's not, they don't have much control over that machine, how it's connecting to the network, whether or not they can find it, whether or not they do have connectivity. Because quite often, uh, an enterprise will call up and say, your network must be down because I can't find this machine. And it very well may be that the application is hung up while you do have connectivity. And we have tools that you can put on the SIM that uh, allow you to ping the machine, the operator, can actually send it a, a command, a, a, an SMS message, and say, hey, check, check with the cellular radio, tell me uh, what network we're attached to, give me the signal strength, tell me how it's reported in, and the operator at that point can actually prove that this is not my problem at this point, this is, this is in, in your uh, application, so. Kevin? Good afternoon. Kevin Peterson, at t Digital Life. We offer a full suite of connected home products, or Bucket Steel, Linus's Thunder here, Thoughtful Home. That's, uh, I like that. You know, um, so the connected home really ranges from security, automation, management, control, but in essence, what we're doing is we're bringing 
a lot of the products and services folks like these bring to market into a solution and really a set of meaningful experiences that add value to your life. And that's that's at, at the heart of, I think, when you think of IoT connected home, you, you gotta come back to a value proposition. Uh, and it starts with the experience, bridging it back to something that means something to you and allows you to personalize that. And I know a lot of the questions I saw uh, come back to that even at a macro level, but at, at, the end of the, at the end of the day, we have to solve something. And that's something we're solving is different depending on who you're talking to. And it may even change depending on the day of the week or if something happens in your life. So um, I look forward to the discussion. Great. Well, thank you for those introductions. So you have here a panel of folks occupying very different uh, spaces in the connected home industry. And a lot of, a lot of industries are looking at how they can become, uh, tap into the connected uh, innovation space. But I've got a question for you, and maybe we can start with you, Kevin. What is the purpose and value of connectivity in the home? So I kind of think about it as like air, right? It's, it's connectivity is air, right? It's the foundation. Without the connectivity, the re you don't have anything else. Um, and I think it's becoming more and more meaningful. As you, got, as you have more devices, you have more use cases, you have more bandwidth consumption happening in the home, becomes, it, you said something interesting, right? So it's, it's how do I get more insight as to am I connected, how am I connected, what's connected, what can I do with what's connected, and then how do I bring them together to make it meaningful? But it starts in a foundation. You think about a pyramid, a home, but the, the foundation is connectivity. Um, it's also the battleground and a key to the experience, as you, regardless of where you're at. Anyone else want to key off that? I would just add that I think, I think Kevin, Kevin's right in terms of, you know, it, you know, when you start with the consumer and you talk about, look, there's quality of life, there's convenience and there's security, there's the benefit of efficiency. We all know time and money, but it's also about getting the most out of technology. People have unique experiences, individual use cases. We have over 500 different use cases where people call in and what do they want to do? Some people want to stream music from their phone to their TV as well as to their PC. Other people want to be able to remotely be able to check on what's going on in security. Other people want to be able to, from their car driving home, be able to turn their lights on when they get there. Okay, so the fact of the matter is, is that I think that there's extreme value in the technology and what it can enable, as well as the solutions it can bring in terms of the way in which the person wants to experience it, at what point, at what time, as well as, frankly, in a way in which that makes them more productive and personal utility to them, in terms of, so it's meaningful, not at, you know, in terms of, at just at a broader level. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to, um, to think there are, there are two kinds of connected products. There are products that are connected, but you don't really understand why they're connected. And then there are products that are great products, and they happen to be connected. Um, so I think the way we approach this is we think about what's, what's the value? What's the, what's the problem that can be solved, you know, in this case, in the home? Um, so let me take you one example. So one of our products is a, is a carbon monoxide detector. Um, the Nest Protect can detect carbon monoxide. If there were no connectivity, uh, there would be a carbon monoxide alarm in that home. Uh, you may not be at home. Um, and you, you may not hear that, that that alarm went off, right? And when you get home, the battery is out, so you don't know. You walk into a deadly home, right? It has high levels of carbon monoxide. Um, with connectivity, we can allow our Nest Protect to talk directly, not only to the phone, to tell you, hey, there's carbon monoxide detected in your home, uh, but also to the thermostat. So the thermostat can say, oh boy, there's, there's carbon monoxide in this home. I should turn off the furnace, because that's a likely source of carbon monoxide leak. So now, in the background, there's connectivity happening in the home and outside of the home uh, that solves a problem uh, in the background with, it, with the customer really not thinking about the connectivity aspect of that. Yeah, I'll add to that too, because I think the key phrase there was without thinking about it. Um, we use a phrase called conservation without sacrifice. I think everybody is, is good with saving energy, um, whether it's for uh, financial reasons or they just want to feel good about how much they're consuming but people don't want to be messing with their devices all the time. I don't want to optimize my ceiling fan just so I can save 5% on my air conditioning bill. So if you can deliver an experience where somebody doesn't have to think about it, this is happening in the background, then I think that is actually what technology development is about. Um, I'll also say that the question Lydia asked everybody is what is the purpose and value of a connected product is the question that every product manufacturer should ask itself before they get into the space. 
Um, are we delivering incremental value by making this a connected product? What does connected mean in the context of what we're developing? Uh, I think we've all seen the, the novelty items and the things that are controlled by apps, um, but really those are, um, I think as you put it, uh, problems in search of a, uh, or solutions in search of a problem. Um, so that's a good question I think everybody should think about. Yeah, I, I would just add that um, we're still in the early days of this, uh, connected home. And if you, if you look at what's happened in industry or in enterprise, um, it, it gets to a point where it actually will start to open up new business models. And if you look at what's happening now, you can buy these products and connect them and install them in your house. But you know, think of things like, um, of, uh, <laughs> th th think of things like uh, copy machines, uh, where the, 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 com the model has changed, right? You don't buy a copy machine anymore. You, you pay for the copies as you're using them. So as things become more and more connected, it opens up new business models, uh, and I think you're going to start to see some of these things start to shift into the home in these types of business models also going forward. You know, the one thing, if I could, connectivity provides data. It's an avenue, right? It's a highway. Uh, data that, that rides that highway then becomes meaningful to the extent that you can use it either in predictive ways or truly just in enhancing the product that you're providing. Um, back to the, the notion you guys brought up is connectivity means nothing in and of itself, but it's a matter of how you harness it and what you do with it and how you present it is everything. Kevin, you bring up a good point. How do your companies approach and use big data and also what steps do you take or how do you ensure privacy as well in what you offer? Yeah, so I mean, we're at the very base of that um, at Able Device. We put everything on the SIM, which is an extremely secure element at that point. And to just kind of also build on the point I was making earlier about it, it's, it's going to open up new business models. And at that point, quality of service becomes very, very important it, because it is the business model, making sure you have consistent connectivity and that it can't be uh, disrupted or hacked or, 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 or uh, and that it's there all the time. And I think the mobile network, and you know, people ask me quite often with some of these things, well, well why the mobile network as opposed to um, you know, Wi-Fi in a house? I already have Wi-Fi in the house. And the answer might be because you need a certain level of quality of service that needs to be managed. And if the homeowner themselves is responsible for their own Wi-Fi, you don't really know uh, how secure that is. You don't know what else is on, on that network. And you don't know, you know, how, you know how, how did they tune the network. I mean, they're, they're radio tuning in a house uh, by, by consumers. Whereas you do have a certain level of quality of service um, that's defined within the mobile network and, and some control. You have a party there that is responsible for providing you that level of service. Sure, I can comment a bit about uh, data and, and customer privacy and security. I think uh, it, it's not only about making sure the network is secure, but uh, for us it's a lot about um, our, our data policy and, and uh, um, being very transparent with customers on what data uh, we are collecting and how that data is being used. So um, we're trying to be almost overly transparent and clear about uh, data data connections that are they're being made. So as an example, with with Kevin and his team, um, we've done an integration between uh, the Nest thermostat and the Digital Life um, customer experience, the the app. And there is some data being transferred between our systems to enable that, uh, so that you from the Digital Life app can um, can control your Nest thermostat. And um, we've designed an, an enrollment process, an opt-in process for that, where the customer uh, is essentially agreeing to those controls to be enabled and that data to flow between Nest and at and to enable that, that use case and that value. So I think for us it's very much about being, being clear, transparent, uh, always ask the customer and giving the, the customer choice. Go ahead, Sam. No. Hey, the only thing I would add, because I think you hit it head, head on in terms of the transparency and the usage, um, this is not a static problem. It's an ongoing problem. So in addition to the transparency and usage and choice, um, security, we have all responsibility to make sure we protect the vulnerabilities of the information that we collect, and then how do we make sure that it's, because the bad guys are always going to be bad guys trying to get the data. And so we have a responsibility to continue to watch the security aspect of it from a vulnerability perspective. And I think we invest a lot of time in that as well, too. Just one other comment. I don't want to be written. 
be redundant, but I would say data, valuable, precious asset. How you use it means a lot as you think about the complete experience. It's not just about once the product's in the home, it's about how you sell, about how you install, how you support, how you allow products to work together, and then after you've earned that trust, because it is it is a, the customer owns their data. However, earning that trust and unlocking a value proposition then opens up these secondary models, which I think will become increasingly important part of the value proposition from an economic point of view as to what the connected home truly means. All right, data, you, you, you talked in some of the questions about regulatory bodies, whether it's an energy company or an insurance company or a whole lot of our other consumer branded R&D type functions can be informed by this. However, it's got to make sense for the consumer and they have to feel comfortable giving it, right? So we're at the very onset, very first inning if you put it. Um, we got to make sure we make good judgment calls as to what we're doing with it, how we're protecting it, and how we're putting it back out in front of the customer so it's a it, it, it's an engaging, transparent relationship. Alex, can I Yeah. Apart from how you uh, protect and secure the data, I think from a product manufacturer's perspective, the key word in big data is big. It is of no interest to me, to our company, how any individual is using his or her product at any given time because we can't do anything with that information. I think what we look at when we're consuming data is macro level aggregated statistics and that still doesn't answer the why question. It's interesting and it may give you some insight in terms of how your products are being used uh, and allow you to optimize for the future, uh, both from a user experience and a new product development perspective. So I do think it's valuable in that front. But again, data will tell you what, but it won't tell you why. So we take great pride in actually knowing all of our customers. We are direct to consumer business and we contact every person that, that buys a product from us, that uses our product, uh, because we take great value in not just seeing the statistics, but talking to them, understanding how they're using our products, what they'd like to see in the future. So I think the, the big data piece is interesting to us because that gives you line of sight that you never would have had before. Um, but there is a limit to, I think, what, <clears throat> excuse me, what a product manufacturer can actually do with that data once it's consumed. Consumers are expected to have even more connected devices in their home pretty soon, so that's a lot of devices, uh, many more networks. What are your company's approaches to ensuring interoperability uh, between technology, be, between technologies or, or networks? Linus? Yeah, I can, I can um, start there. Uh, can you hear me, guys? Yep, back on, back on uh, the mic. So um, we are approaching, obviously, interoperability is super important, um, and it, it's a real challenge. So with devices that live on Wi-Fi networks, Zigbee network, networks, you know, Bluetooth, uh, Z-Wave, Thread, et cetera, et cetera, how do you make this all work? So we decided that uh, the fastest and easiest way to create interoperability is actually in the cloud. So we started um, an, a an open API program called Works with Nest. So any product that is connected to the cloud can now connect to a Nest product through the cloud. So there's no interoperability in the home uh, between these devices. It's a cloud-to-cloud -cloud connection. Um, and the, and the, great, um, the great thing with that is we can do it right now. And we can do it across brands, across networks in the home. Um, the second level is obviously to see what can we do to make these devices interoperable in the home. And uh, we are um, co-founders of, of the, uh, the Thread Alliance. And it's a mesh protocol that um, we have actually, earlier this year, we, we released an open source uh, implementation of Thread, uh, essentially to allow other companies to quickly um, uh, build products with connectivity that could connect and interoperate, uh, interoperate with other products in the home. Um, so we're addressing this both on, the, on a cloud level as well as uh, by working with other, other companies on, on new standards like Thread. Kevin? No, I, I would say interoperability means a couple things. I would say, one, as Linus addressed, you've got connectivity, right? So how do I actually meet you to, to be able to extract data and exchange data? I, I, I agree with Linus. We participate in that program. Um, the API level does allow you to rise above the morass of, of, of radios, protocols, because at the end of the day, you, one thing you can't do is wait for standards, nor can you chase putting... a 
a, you know, 10 radios in your device. It just doesn't make sense from a cost, performance, reliability standpoint. So I think the cloud does give you a way of, of broadening the ecosystem and, and giving a, a value proposition very quickly uh, across a, a, a great array of devices. So part two though, so now it's connected, now I can see you, now I can exchange data, now what? And the now what, when you get to that point, is allowing the devices to work together within an experience. If this, then that. Or triggers, notifications, um, conditions. So interoperability needs to be seamless. Doesn't, it needs to be blind to the customer, um, and it's, it's essential. Uh, as you think about connectivity, interoperability, data, these are all ingredients coming back to a recipe of value and a broadened experience to make a connected home meaningful and real to a customer. Yeah, for, for, for us, um, the SIM is a global standard. Every SIM, no matter where they are, are the, are the same. And that's one reason why we developed the technology we did. Um, uh, it, it enables operators to put a, a set of tools on the one standard thing that's in every device that's connected. So depending on how the architecture of, of a connected device is, somebody might have uh, built the application using a Texas Instrument microcontroller, and somebody else might have built something using an, an ARM 7 processor. That makes it very difficult to put sets of standardized tools that work consistently across the network. And that's the very core of what we do. And also SIMs do work uh, in Wi-Fi networks so for authentication, a lot of operators, it's much more common in Europe, uh, although I think you've, you've actually launched um, some technology that um, authenticates on, on different uh, Wi-Fi networks. So it, it, it is, again, no matter what it is, it's a global standard. It's updatable over the air in, in, in a standard fashion. It's done the same whether you're in Singapore or if you're in San Francisco. So that's, that's where we, you know, that's part of our core value proposition. Cindy or Alex? Sure. I, I would say that I have, we have a, just a little bit of a different um, spin and what I mean by that is, so in connectivity sometimes, you're only as good as your weakest link. And sometimes your weakest link is the user, okay? And so let's say that all the standards are put in place and let's say there's global standards and there's compatibility and it's all done. This is all about driving, as Kevin said, value, but also usage and personal benefit. If the, if the technology and the complexity is so difficult for the user that they can't figure out how to work it and make sure it's compatible, and if they can't you know, get it to interoperate, they're not going to use it. So you can have all the standards in the world, you can have all the compatibility, but you won't have people like leveraging that. And so what we do is we help to actually have people that when they actually put this equipment across the board in, the, in their homes that may be different than the home that's across the street, and they want to figure out a way to actually make the, the connectivity that now is standardized, compatible to what they want in their home and to their own personal experience, we walk them through that. We help to understand what they're trying to accomplish, what, into their inter what they're trying to get done, what are the different services, how they're going to use it, and then we help them to actually make that happen. So sometimes someone's got to focus on the user themselves because I would tell you that 67% of the people out there are not getting as much benefit out of just their simple smartphone today. And when we move that to the home, despite standards, we have to make sure that usage and penetration is gonna come from their ability to actually be able to see and be able to manage themselves. Yeah, I mean, you, you would talk about engagement. If, if I'm not engaging, I'm not using. If I'm not using, I stop buying, right? Very simple. Uh, from our perspective, I think Interoperability is actually secondary. Um, we have nothing to say to the toaster oven. We probably don't want to talk to your locks. Um, I think there are interesting use cases and, and we're building towards that. Um, like Linus mentioned, we're actually uh, also a founding member of the Thread Group. Um, and I think that's important uh, in a future tense that everything can work together seamlessly. But from where our company is right now, we focus really on the product as a standalone knowing that 99% of our consumers are buying it because of that product. They're not buying an ecosystem from us. Um, now conceivably, they would want to build onto that over time, and I think that's an important consideration whenever you're building a product, is how do you plan to make it future-proof? How do you plan to provide updates? 
and there's not a one-size-fits-all solution depending on who you are in the market, but it certainly changed the game for hardware manufacturers who are building a product like a ceiling fan that's warranted to last 30 years at the rate of change in the home in terms of connectivity and wireless standards. Um, so with one of our newer products, we actually introduced um, a, a neat installation feature where the consumer could actually remove uh, the wireless module in the future and replace it with another one if that was appropriate. Now there's no value to the consumer in that today, it's just part of the regular installation process. But I think those are the kinds of thoughtful considerations you have to, to, to take under consideration when you're actually building a hardware product that somebody is not going to want to change out every five years. So this morning during the keynote remarks, we heard a little bit about what government can do to help enable the, IO, uh, the IoT and 5G. What do you all think uh, is the role of companies and government working together to, to reach that end as well? Um, who wants to start? Kevin? Sure. You know, I, I often don't think about the government and moving ahead, right? Um, I think the government, you can kind of minimize complexity. What you don't want to do is hold on to rules, standards that are old, tired, and don't apply, right? So shed your skin. Uh, and you've got to embrace the future versus look in the past, right? And I think you've got to think about it more from a, a value business perspective. Uh, you know, because it's, it's, you know, again, I think there's a lot of great things the government can do, but they've got to have a balancing act in terms of, of, uh, of where you step in and where you stay out. Um, you know, from a company standpoint, you have to, obviously you have to abide by the law, especially when you're providing a professional secure pro security product. Um, but we've also we've also helped change the law where it doesn't make sense because you need to bring cost down, and costs that are unneeded as a byproduct of a standard or a rule that was put in place for a very different reason at a very different time and you know time and age. Um, we need to relook. So again, I would just reiterate um, regulation, government. Um, information standards are all great. You just have to harness them and relook at them in a way that's meaningful and value oriented. If you're trying to to broaden, um, you know, broaden the ecosystem and take technology to the next level to meaningful impact somebody's life without doing without costing thousands of dollars when it shouldn't. Just a quick follow up. What exactly are you do you have in mind when you make those remarks? Either spurring innovation or get, getting rid of other regulation. I, I didn't hear you, I'm sorry. Which regulations do you have in mind with those remarks? So I, I can speak specifically to the security industry, right? So technology has dramatically changed since a lot of the security laws were put in place. I, I, you know, it's, and we, we've changed some, others are pushing others, but I think it's, it's inherent for us to go back and relook and think about changes in technologies, changes in customers' preferences, willingness to adopt um, and embrace change as to what what it means as to what barriers, you know, from a product um, standpoint, right? Yeah, in some ways, you have to let the market shape what technology is brought in the home, why, and how it needs to be used. The only, the only thing I would add to what Kevin said, which I think is important, and you, you mentioned it, which is key. Um, you know, we, along with CTIA, are in line with them in terms of a light touch on the regulatory, uh, in terms of that piece. And, and I'm in the insurance industry, which is highly regulated, so it's, again, but light touch in terms of that piece. We have to be able to allow innovation also, though. Innovation is key to actually bring the services that people want uh, to themselves. And I would also say that what Kevin, I thought, made also an excellent point about, which is, you can't look at um, the the population as just a big blob, and, and there are segments, you know, when we talk about no one likes to be called a millennial anymore, I guess, so you can call, pick your generation, X, Y, big boomer, ba whatever, okay? They have different needs and different uses, and they, you know, my kids are on the web and would put it out there all day long and don't care, and, and frankly, have evolved, and will have different needs in their digital life, and their digital homes, what they want to do to bring connected, than what I might want to protect going forward. And I think the government's got to be aware of the changes that are going on, as well as, for me, the biggest issue is what you've already mentioned, which is the privacy aspect from a consumer perspective, just making sure that we're all aware of what the requirements are. And the other thing with government is expectations. You know, they need to be clear and consistent, and it's got to be a fair playing field for all of us in terms of that. And then outside of that, allow the market and innovation and the value to the customer play out. Roger, I see you nodding your head. Yeah, this, 
there's you know two things that are going through my mind right now. I've been I've been in machine to machine or Internet of Things since the the mid '90s, so I've I've seen quite a lot and a lot of changes. And in, in the in the late '90s, I spent a lot of time in Brazil, and you would actually see people innovating, trying to, to do these applications. But the, the regulation of the government, the regulation of the mobile networks and taxes that they layer on, on for each SIM card and each subscription, just made the, the business cases not work at all because it was just too expensive. The, the, all the regulation was based on a wealthy business person traveling with, with, a, with a handset. And it, it just it did a lot of damage to the vehicle tracking industry. It, it impeded its progress. It's, it's come quite a way since then. And then the second thing that popped in my head as, as we were talking about this was I was involved uh, early on with Progressive Snapshot, that device that you put in your car and monitors your driving. Well, the, the guys at Progressive, you, you know, they had to release that on a state-by-state -state basis because they had to go to each state's insurance board, which is separate in each state, to get permission to do that. So it wasn't one nationwide rollout, it was, a, it was 50 unique rollouts. Right. So when you start to see industries that are regulated, insurance or whatever, where it's the state regulations, and this is coming now too, you have this technology that's in between autonomous trucks, the platooning of trucks, where they all line up and form like a choo-choo train almost, and, and the lead truck takes control. But now you have to go to each one of the, those states and see what those regulations are. Do the state police have a problem with this? What, what's going to happen? So you see whole industries that, that it's very specific in that vertical um, where they have to deal with the regulation. Yeah, com complexity drives cost, which is a barrier to adoption, which slows down versus incents competition, innovation, and growth. Linus, did you want to add something? Uh, no, I, think, I think most of the main points have been said. I think uh, leveling the playing field, reducing the, the barriers, cost barriers to you know um, competition and innovation, I think are the main the main points. Yeah, I think where I'd like to see the scales tip a bit is away from regulation and into research. Uh, you know, the government sets a lot of ambitious goals for various sectors, whether it's transportation, whether it's healthcare, energy, and a lot of this technology can be applied in a really meaningful way to help accomplish those goals. Um, so I'm not saying you shouldn't regulate because there are definitely safety, security, privacy concerns, but I'd like to see some of that effort uh, redeployed towards research and see how we can drive these technologies faster um, to solve real problems. Well, I think it's time for some audience Q&A. Does anyone have a question they'd like to ask? Sir? And does he get a mic? Can you please say your name and who you're with when you before you ask your question? Yes, thank you. Hi, my name is uh, Andri from Indonesia. Uh, my question goes to Alex, and probably the rest can add some experience also. Alex, what is actually your business model? No, not Alex, uh, Kevin, sorry, Kevin. What is actually your business model to all uh, the solution? Are you providing the ecosystem as uh, Alex mentioned, or are you just providing connectivity to all of this uh, uh, solution? Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> it, it, it's, I mean, Ms. Barlock, but, it, but it's both. It's, it's, it's one hand, you can't have one hand clapping. So our, our, when we set out in this space, the one thing we, we, we knew is we wanted to provide our own ecosystem. But our ecosystem, what I mean by that is, is a platform, right, first and foremost, integrated intelligently within AT&T where it made sense, but then more importantly, giving yourself the, the, the ability to control the roadmap, the technology, and open yourself or avail yourself to, to um, new solutions, right? So what I'm getting at is, is yes, you, buy, you provide conductivity, provide a platform, you partner where it makes sense, and you think about the experience from A to Z. And, and to me, that's what an ecosystem and a value proposition comes back to. But it, it, the home is complicated, as you know, right? And so, so can't have one without the other, but one complements the other if done right and presented back to the customer in a meaningful, simple, value-oriented way. And I think that is 
ultimately what we're all getting at here, um, regardless of the question, right? It's kind of your thoughtful home. How do I go from being a, a, a connected home, a, you know, kind of a, a dumb pipe going to the home to actually taking that connection and now doing something with it in a very simple, artful way um, that allows you to personalize? Yeah, I, I can comment a little bit. I think, I think we're thinking about um, the business model or more the customer engagement model in terms of three steps. One is um, just provide a great product solving one problem. We think that it's confusing today for many consumers to think about a smart home or connected home and there are lots of futuristic sort of promises out there. So we think uh, the real world problems, you know, wouldn't it be great if I can reduce the amount of money I pay to my utility every month? Or wouldn't it be great to know what my dog is up to when I'm at work, right? And we provide one product to solve that problem. And then if you happen to buy, you're happy with that product and you buy another Nest product, now we can add more value. So that's the use case about carbon monoxide, for instance. You have the carbon monoxide detector, it can actually talk to the thermostat and keeps you safer. And it's not something that the customer thinks about when they're buying that product. They're buying a thermostat for the heating and cooling and a smoke detector for being safe. But then there are added value when it all comes together. And the third step is the ecosystem. So that's where the, the Works with Nest um, APIs come into play, where we can connect with, with a fan, right? And the fan can now be optimized in, uh, together with a the thermostat. Again, happening behind the scenes, really without the customer thinking about that particular value, more thinking about the fan providing the value in itself and the thermostat in itself. But over time, it all connects and, and become a greater value. Do we have another question? Wow, an audience for the questions. Well, I have a question. Where do you all think the connected home is going to go in the next five or 10 years? What are you expecting it to look like or what do you want it to look like? Cindy? I, I think there's big opportunity in uh, the do-it-yourself aspect of the connected home. Um, I think there's gonna be a lot of penetration of people like my husband who, you know, all I wanna do is turn the TV on in my house and I can't, okay, I'm like, you know, just, what happened to the old remote, you know, push this, push that, you know, but he's got it all set up and we've got a, a rack of uh, equipment in my upstairs attic that it looks like an old switch center, that's great. But then there's gonna be a, a lot of DIY. I, and, I, and, and I think there's gonna be a lot of people who, it, again, are gonna take a look at what works for me, what's gonna enable me to give me the best experience, and some people are gonna do exactly what he said, add, start adding devices and connect on, someone's gonna go in and bring a full control four into the home, and then there's gonna be somebody who's gonna add individual elements on, and it's all gonna be tied back into, I think, enabling the devices and the technology that'll give us the best opportunity to be efficient and to drive, um, again, uh, compatibility. I think uh, ambient voice is going to be uh, really focused on over the next five years, and that's uh, we've started to see the periphery of it um, with voice-activated assistants, either through mobile phones or always on speakers. Uh, and I think people find delight in that sort of experience because no matter how much automation you put into your home, there's always circumstances that change. So to have flexibility and control in the most seamless way is a good thing. Uh, but I think for that to really push through, it's going to have to be you talking to your home, not you talking to your phone, not talking to something in the corner. It has to be more natural. So we're seeing developments in understanding natural language, um, not just voice interpretation, but actually understanding um, syntax in the context of the conversation. Um, and we're seeing parallel developments to product, to integrated voice, you know, where it's been relegated to the phone for, for a, quite a few years actually, um, into a more natural environment in the home. So I think that's where we'll see a lot of concentration over the next five years. Roger, Kevin? Uh, yeah, I, I think, um, as I said earlier, I think you'll start to see over time uh, business models change for different devices in the house. Uh, maybe uh, more things you will pay for as a service as opposed to actually buying a, a product and you'll, you'll pay for it as you use it the way that you want to use it. Um, I also think that over time, um, there's going to need to be a shift um, to how devices, how you manage your devices and what your relationship is with all of them. Right now, um, pretty much you're buying a device, whatever it is, and the service is being provided by the company that, that's sold you the device. 
at this point. But if you really want to look at how to get the most uh, utility out of everything and, and also how to mine big data uh, devices in relationship to other devices, I think it, it has to get to where you have, let's say, a, a platform that's like Facebook, um, but for your stuff. So I instead of just making friends with people you know, you can make friends with your stuff. So you would have them all in one place no matter who the manufacturer is and what the underlying service is, right? Then you'd, you'd really know what was going on and there would be a lot of utility to that uh, in big data. Because then you'd be able to say, well, people who drive Volvos usually have this kind of blender and live in this zip code kind of stuff. That's where you're starting to really manage. And as I've, I've jokingly said, I tell this story a lot, you know, my stuff can uh, become friends with, you know, Kevin's stuff. So, you know, the, the front gate to my community might become friends with his car. So that when you pull up, it knows you're, you're a friend. And by the way, you like to jump in my hot tub, so get the hot tub going, you know, something like that. Then I think that's the, you know, over time, that's what it's, it's going to shift to. Right now, we're not there because, this, again, these are early days and you have manufacturers now that are trying to provide a service to something they sell you. And over time, they'll shift to more of a service model. And then as time goes on, all those services will start to have to work together for you to get the most out of it. One, I would, I, I'm going to echo something you said. It's, it's business models. Sorry. Come on out if you'd like. Are you sure? All right. The, uh, uh, it's business models. I think new business models have to and will emerge. Uh, and I think of both direct and indirect. What I mean by that is, is a direct relationship with the consumer or indirect with, with other partners, um, either in the ecosystem or not in the ecosystem today. But I do think the, and I'm going to go back to, you know, you made another good point, the relationship, right? And I think there's the relationships, the boundaries have to change, uh, which will help fuel new and different business models, which I think is key. Um, you know, you could talk about technology, you could talk about value proposition, but you've got to get back to the core, uh, which is ultimately going to propel this, is, is, is business models, the economics that come from the business models, and ultimately the value proposition that emerges for the consumer, which ripples back through. Uh, I think the other thing in, in is how you interact and how things interact with one another and come back to you uh, will we'll continue to evolve and it, it's very important. Do we have time for Linus to respond? So we'll have Linus respond. If he does a quick wrap up, we might be able to get one more question in. So if you want. Um, okay, I'll, I'll just add one more. There are lots of good uh, comments here about the, the future. Um, I'm just going to pick out one area that I think is going to be very, very uh, interesting in the next couple of years, just looking at the age demographics in this country and globally, frankly, um, just figuring out how can we help uh, elderly stay in their homes, uh, stay safe, stay healthy, and, and apply technology to, uh, to improve um, the, the living for, for the elderly in the population. Do, sir? So we'll do, I'm going to ask you to direct your question to one panelist since we only have about 60 seconds left. Um, I guess this uh, could be used for uh, Linus. Um, right now with everything disconnected, you don't have to get the same brand of everything. Uh, my lock set on my door could be a different brand than my uh, carbon monoxide detector, so on and so forth. Um, with everything being connected, is there a solution to where there's not proprietary, where I have to buy all Nesta for all one brand for my house to be connected properly for everything to talk to each other safely? Uh, yeah, so that is exactly why we uh, launched the Works with Nest program. Uh, we realized we're not going to build all the great products out there. So we're going to focus on a few categories. And then there are going to be other companies that build great door locks or break great lights or great fans. And uh, we got 20,000 uh, companies today that are actually building those connections. So you do have door locks that interoperate with you know, our thermostat or fans that, that interoperate with a the thermostat or with a smoke detector. So I absolutely see a future where multi-brand um, products can interoperate in the, in the home. Today we can do it over the cloud and we can do it uh, in a way where sort of magic things are happening in the background, uh, but it's only the beginning. And, and they will also move into the, uh, into the home level, inside the home. Um, we're working with Yale as a door lock company to actually have uh, uh, an interconnection you know, in the home as opposed to in the cloud. So that is definitely something that, that is being sold as we speak. Well, 
that's our time. Thank you for coming to the panel. Thank you.